Welcome once again to the Life After Death Explored podcast. On this episode, we are going to go deeper into the incredible world of life beyond the confines of the physical brain, beyond the confines of what is known as physical death, and discuss first-hand experiences in the state known as an afterlife. If you are new here, consider listening to the first episode first, where we go into the historical and evidential areas of information in a very brief, very concise way, including the three dozen or so areas of information presented by Victor Zamet at victorzamet.com, including various categories and subcategories, be it precognition and transmediumship and mental mediumship, physical mediumship, and reincarnation, and a host of other subjects, which each one could be expanded upon or even given volumes of information to study. In fact, certainly each individual subject has volumes available to research if you know where to look. So as I am basically saying, it's a um, incredibly vast subject covered not very extensively. There's not many people presenting this information to the public, and that's one reason I do the work that I do. With that said, um, if you are interested in these subjects and the fact that you're still listening makes me think probably you are, then consider the different ways to get involved. This is a new podcast, but the YouTube channel Afterlife Topics and Metaphysics has much, much more content that you can check out. The Facebook group Afterlife Topics and Metaphysics is a big community of people discussing these issues and I draw inspiration and stories from the people on that group who share their experiences and share their ideas. In fact, I think the uh, people on that group help to make almost every episode and every video I do and certainly the books that I write. As for the books, we have Understanding Life After Death and The Afterlife and Beyond. They're available on Amazon.com, AfterlifeTopics.com. You can even order them at Barnes & Noble if you prefer to do it that way. And those books, uh, if you enjoy reading, then uh, they provide in-depth ideas about these subjects that you can reference uh, and hopefully would be of some benefit to you. With that said, on this episode, we are going to go in a different direction from the first episode, which was a brief summary of the evidential areas, and we're going to turn to the journalistic side. So my approach to this field is to acquire real experience so that I can look at the theories, I can look at the ideas, I can look at the scientific possibilities, and research all of that, and then hopefully actually apply it, actually experience those things in real life to be able to see, well, what's accurate and what's not accurate. This is a journalistic process. It's about reporting. It's not about gaining scientific credibility. I think both of these things kind of have to go together. And as such, it is prone to subjectivity and error. But basically, you are trusting me as a reporter of information, as somebody providing anecdotes that you can use to critically evaluate the subject, not necessarily to definitively say it's this way or it's that way, but that you can look at, study, compare to other people's experiences, and maybe it will help you get a clearer understanding. Or if you are able to have your own experiences, then you can ping pong off of the ideas I presented on this podcast. And maybe you can use that to get a better understanding or possibly even ask people on that side questions that you can derive from this podcast or things that you've heard me talk about. That's the way I approach this subject and it's the only way that makes sense to me. Interestingly, I first became interested in all of this 
when I was about 12 or 13 years old. Not many other adolescent kids, I think, were wondering about this, but coming from a ranch out in the desert, uh, I had a little bit too much free time on my hands, especially during the summers without many people around, sadly not as many friends as I think an adolescent kid should have. So with a dial-up internet connection and a remote part of the woods where I'm surprised we even had internet for crying out loud, I was able to begin asking these questions to the early search engines such as Yahoo and Hotbot and also a fledgling search engine at the time called Google. And I found some resources which 20 years later I'm still using uh, to obtain information and to cross-check ideas and to cite even in the work I do these days, including Victor Zamet's work, uh, sites like neardeath.com. And this was at the very inception of it all, but my interest in the subject it, it always was very important to me and it carried through to my teenage years and my 20s and I would always think about these subjects and talk about it on forums and debate things with people and I even did some early work in this area by hosting meetups and doing discussion events and things like that but I never had a personal experience until just a few years ago, until the year 2014. So until that time, all of my research, it was just it was just like theoretical stuff that also benefited me on a philosophical level. So I was able to piece together a personal spiritual philosophy using the possibilities of an afterlife and objective afterlife evidence. And I used this to my benefit and it was very nice, but I mean, without the personal experience, it's it's fascinating because you hear all these fantastic stories, you know, hundreds of them. You, you read about so many of these things and things other people have experienced. And then when it finally happens to you, coming from that angle, you're like, wow, okay, it's it's just like I read about. It's just like I expected. It's just like I thought was going to happen. You can actually have a laugh about it. And that's kind of what my reaction was when I began having out-of-body experiences and astral projection experiences. By the way, if you just heard like a giant 747 airplane go over, I don't have the benefit of having a sound booth and I'm in Malaysia recording this in, an, in a little apartment and uh, for some reason uh, I think the, air, the airport is kind of close by and so I get these giant airplanes coming over and crashing through whatever I'm doing. But anyway, um, 747s aside, what I was saying was you get this, you get this um, you know, perspective of you know about all these concepts and then you get to experience it firsthand and just have a laugh that this is exactly like I thought it was going to be. And the out-of-body experiences are a unique way of having your own supernatural experiences which have varying levels of depth. So some people, they only have once have like a sensation. The famous afterlife skeptic Susan Blackmore in the 1980s had a single potential out-of-body experience involving I believe large amounts of cannabis and this painted a perspective for the rest of her life it changed her career changed uh, the, the trajectory of many of the subjects that she talks about all seemingly about trying to make sense of and ultimately prove to herself that that one experience she had was not real and it was basically part of her brain just cooking up ideas and cooking up hallucinations. And that was just one experience and it had that profound effect and in my opinion led her on a path of complete ignorance as she tried to grapple with how that couldn't be real because it went against her materialistic academic scientific training. And I have a laugh about her story because that was one experience. 
I've now had hundreds of experiences, hundreds of out-of-body experiences of, as I said, varying levels of depth, whether it's just a sensation or something that maybe happened, to honest to God, I left my body, came out of my body, floated around the room, went into a different room, spied on some roommates or guests in a hotel or hostel who were sleeping, went back to my body, or met with a deceased loved one who I physically sat next to and had a 30-minute conversation with. So again, varying levels of depth. But even today, about once a week, I will have an experience somewhere on that scale of depth. In fact, just this afternoon, I took a nap and had a brief experience where I met this kind of middle-aged woman who stopped me and wanted to say hi and shake my hand. I don't know where I was. I don't know what was happening. And so I looked her in the eyes. I shook her hand. I felt her hand. And then my friend was knocking on the door, woke me up. And as soon as I woke up, I could still feel the handshake on my right hand. Like I still felt a sensation on my hand, like uh, the information had just transferred into my brain and was still lingering around and I don't even know what that was I mean who I don't know who that lady was but it was something that lasted like uh, maybe 20 seconds total but there is that definitive sense when you have a real experience involving some other plane of reality which is not a dream when it's not a lucid dream and one of the biggest factors to to verify that you're having a multi-dimensional experience is when the people you meet the characters you meet are definitively real people when you're dreaming you meet projections of your subconscious mind when you're having a para or a multi-dimensional experience you're meeting people that you would think of as real normal people in this world with sovereign ident sovereign identities and their own level of information and understanding which is not going to be part of your own mind and the best i think kind of um, golden standard of proof is when you can meet and talk to somebody who can provide you with information that you don't have access to normally, just like we do in real life. An example might be, can you teach me something in Japanese? And they say, okay, yokoso means uh, welcome. And then you wake up, you think yokoso means welcome. You scramble for a dictionary, you look it up, and then there it is. And you find out, like, I would have never known this, but I just met somebody while I was asleep who provided me objective, detailed information. I have done this on numerous occasions during my experiences. However, the reliability of obtaining objective information very much depends on how lucid your consciousness state is. If your level of lucid awareness drops to low, then it's like you begin falling backward into a subconscious dream state again. When your lucid ability increases and hopefully reaches the level of normal waking clarity or perhaps higher than that, suddenly it's like you're able to connect with people in a space that is objective, it's not within your mind anymore. Because when it's just in your mind, you're having often dream experiences. When it's happening objectively, then you're in a world that's being shared with other people. And it's, it's very important to be able to distinguish between these types of states. Because you can have dreams that are very meaningful and you meet what seems like very real people, but if you don't have that lucid awareness and you're not able to consciously separate yourself from being in a dream environment, then there's a chance that you're not going to have any objective interactions. There's a chance that none of it may even be real. 
But when you gain a high level of lucid awareness, suddenly you can cut through all of that. And it literally seems like the picture on an old analog television becoming clear or the static on a radio suddenly crystallizing. And then you can get the complete unhindered image and all of the dream imagery. And let's face it, dreams can be nonsense. Maybe you're dreaming, you're hanging out with Mario and Luigi, and you are fighting Bowser, or maybe you're with Mario and Luigi, and you're on a adventure, and you're on a boat in the Caribbean. Like a bunch of nonsense. Dreams can be weird like that. When you have the astral experience, all the weirdness it's like it melts away all the symbolism all the metaphors all the stuff that your higher self is cooking up in a what seems like sometimes a drug-induced stupor all that melts away and then you look around and you realize that underneath all of that was a real place that was hiding all along like maybe your brain was interpreting a couple like a couple of italian brothers and you thought well what what are two italian brothers i know of who who are who are two italian brothers that i can wrap my 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 based upon my physical memories in my physical brain um that i can wrap around like like what is the closest point of reference then your brain creates Mario and Luigi from the video game series or you know from the whatever it is of pop culture basically I think everybody knows who Mario and Luigi is but that's that's just a silly example I'm not saying that that's something that that's literally happened but it's like your brain will interpret whatever it is based upon what's already inside of your brain and you won't be able to obtain objective information so you have to in some ways be truly out of your body and be operating independently of your physical body to guarantee you're not in a dream state. And this is when you begin having multidimensional experiences. I believe many people who are lucid dreamers are actually astral projection experiencers going to objective, literal other dimensions, but they just haven't taken the steps to prove that these are real objective spaces. And also on the same note, some people who have astral projection experiences are really lucid dreamers and they may not be having objective experiences. And this is especially true in instances when somebody claims to be having astral projection experiences and it just seems very outlandish something that doesn't add up to the rest of the information or something that gets very weird or a bit nonsensical. For example, consistently very weird, strange, negative or surrealistic experiences where I am a big pink elephant, you know, wandering around a field of lollipops growing out of a a uh, planet made of candy and the clouds are made of cotton candy. Okay, so when you when you when you get like these weird reports, I I think well this is either an objective plane of existence in the astral spectrum that for some reason people created this realm to be able to explore or it's a concocted inner world that that is not shared by other people so it's like a whole planet you know candy planet population one just yourself for whatever reason your higher self cooks that place up so you can live out some weird fantasy that maybe came about from a past life or some past life memory or just some some weird weirdness like that so it's not always certain what information you're getting. But with my experiences, what I try to report as just a little amateur journalist talking about these subjects is I try to base it on objective reality. And look, God bless the pioneers and the, the best people in this realm, people like, the, you know, people from the Monroe Institute, people like William Bowman, of course, people like my friend Jurgen, who 
I think are all the best sources of information about out-of-body experiences, the best sources of information for learning actually how to astral project. And they have the coolest stories of anybody. And they all really are um, you know, the, the, the best people in this field. And of course, uh, Robert Monroe has passed away, but I'm, I'm referring to uh, Bullman and Jurgen and others, you know, other veterans in this area. But I will say that I, I approach this subject differently than the Monroe Institute. I approach it differently than um, great um, philosophers and meditation experts like Jürgen. I approach it differently from, I suppose, a, a, a lot of people in the sense that my, my goal is to connect with other people and to objectively prove their existences. I, I totally get that meditation and inner development and spirituality and learning about these uh, advanced concepts is very important. But to me, what matters and what I think matters the most on a journalistic level is being able to definitively prove that my body here can be unconscious and my consciousness can be someplace else and meeting other real people. Because if I mean, if, because I almost feel like we sometimes get so caught up in the astral projection state as a personal spiritual path or a way to learn about the universe or ourselves or our philosophy, but we f- we forget about kind of like the well, not to redundantly reference elephants, but the elephant in the room which is that this would completely change our scientific understanding, our paradigm, how we see reality, how the world operates, how materialistic science operates. It would just change everything if we could establish that you can be unconscious, lying on your bed, and communicating with real people in a different dimension. Like anything else on top of that are just the details, it's just the you know, philosophy and the theories or whatever, but just if you can get that basic thing established, that to me is the most important thing. The next most important thing is the development and being able to maintain relationships on that side. And why do I make this important? Because most of us care about relationships. Unfortunately, there tends to be very misanthropic people in spiritual communities. Again, one of the great authors, William Bullman, one of personal inspiration. I love William Bullman, but he's a misanthrope. You listen to his lectures, he talks about his fear of ever having to deal with anybody in his family on the other side. He's kind of secretly hoping that we do not reunite with our loved ones. He doesn't see the benefit of that. And in my opinion, he's a misanthrope. But it's not surprising because many people turn to spiritual practices because they don't fit into this world. They maybe they, they, they feel like an alien and maybe they are an extraterrestrial. Maybe they are some kind of star seed. And so they turn inward and they explore their consciousness and other states of existence, other realities. And sometimes that's born from a desire to escape from this world. Well, the thing is, I don't have a desire to escape from this world. I want to actually help people. And I relate more to the vast majority of people who value relationships and are utterly just stricken by grief when their loved ones pass away. And something that I have seen destroy people's lives. And in this context, I can get no value from the work of William Bowman, even though I love William Bowman's work. But what I'm saying is, if you take away the context of interpersonal relationships, if you take away the context of grief, if you take away the context of who we are and where we go and why that matters, then I don't have a personal interest. Because here in this world, You can meet spirit beings by just walking out the door and you'll see them all over the place walking around in human vessels 
and they're unique and crazy and amazing if you can learn to get along with them and develop relationships with them. And uh, I think each person, this is okay, this is going to sound kind of sentimental or be a bit silly, but I think every single soul has a unique place in creation. Like every single soul is absolutely unique and equally important as every other soul. Every person you meet, even people you don't like, even jerks, while in the, in the grand scheme, each one is, is a, kind of this perfect creation of, if you want to call it God. And he, there's infinite souls, and each one is infinitely important. There's nobody who is less important. This is why on a philosophical scale, I tend to distance myself from t certain tenets or certain um, branches of Buddhism that and also Hinduism, mind you, that minimize the individual, that minimize the individual personality. I don't think that that's a good way of looking at the universe. And if you've ever been in love or if you've ever had children, and I wouldn't know because I don't have children, but uh, I've had nieces and nephews, and I, I, I it's like I, I, I get it. If you've had children, then, I mean, that love of this other person is so deep there's just no denying how powerful that is in fact it's so powerful that people who have near-death experiences they say they went into the light and they met the face of god if you will like the light or the you know the all-encompassing love of everything or the uh, source consciousness and still they're like this is awesome but i need to get back to my kids and they're like, yeah, of course. And then they end that mystical experience on this much, much, much higher level plane of existence, which I think we can all have access to if we want. And they come back to this world because of their kids. And you read about this a lot when you study near-death experiences. So love between individual unique souls seems to be more powerful than even these cosmic mystical experiences. It is this kind of, you know, trueness of reality. So if you present to me research or a philosophy or a religious idea that minimizes all of that or says that when we pass away, we become formless consciousness that has no personality and no identity and is just pure bliss floating around for eternity or whatever, you know, all these new age ideas i have no interest in that because i think that it's misinformation and i think a lot of it is people who are kind of misanthropic and then they approach the subject from that angle they don't put value on other people but let me tell you you can practice all of these ex experiences and practice meditation till the day you till the day you kick the bucket and transition to that side but if you can't learn how to love other people and have basically mystical experiences just through your relationships with others, then I don't think you're really developing on a, quote, spiritual level at all. So I'm just revealing this so people listening who are new to my thoughts and ideas know where I'm coming from. So when I have out-of-body experiences, I care about the identities of people, who they are, what their stories are, where they're coming from, what they have to say, what they have to tell me about their lives, uh, and becoming friends with those people, even unlikely instances, even like weird, like non-human entities that I've met and things like that. I'm still like, well, this is still an individual soul, an infinitely important, created by the one infinite creator as a, represent a fractal representation of existence. And it's this person's existence is as important as every other person's existence, and it's completely original, completely unique. It's my job to learn about this person and tell their story. And that's what I care about. So I don't care about expanding my consciousness to the 18th dimension so I can obtain superpowers and be an all-enlightened being so that I can go on Facebook and brag about how enlightened I am and go to some yoga seminar and talk down to all my students because I'm more enlightened than them or whatever it is that, quote, spiritual people do. I don't care about any of that stuff. I just care about connecting with people, learning about people, proving that other people can exist in different dimensions, that we can go to them, meet with them, interact with them, and go to those types of realms ourselves and settle into new lifestyles after we pass away here. Okay, 
With that said, here at the 30 minute mark, I will now go into talking about some of my experiences and what lines up and what doesn't in regard to uh, the uh, objective information about an afterlife. So my first major experience was in 2014, as I said, and it was very unexpected because I wasn't expecting that I would suddenly start having out-of-body experiences. I've been travel. I've rather I've been learning about an afterlife for for a long time. I knew what out-of-body experiences were. My brother, when I was growing up in rural Arizona, my older brother talked about his out-of-body experiences. Those didn't work out so well. They became a very negative experiences. I'm sorry to say. And in a future episode, I will talk about how to not end up like what was happening to my brother. But I knew about them, I knew what it was. It wasn't the forefront of my interest, partially because I found NDEs and mediumship communication and physical mediumship to be more interesting subjects. But I was aware that it was possible to maybe have real experiences in like an afterlife yourself without having to be having cardiac arrest. It's possible. Some people claim they could actually go to the other side and come back with information. Some people even would say that they go every single night and they, you know, they go to the afterlife, the astral plane of existence, higher dimensional world, they come back with information. So I knew about all of that, never experienced it, wasn't expecting to start having it happen until it happened. And I was... I, believe I was taking a midday nap. I would come to find that I am most inclined to have OBEs during midday naps. I don't don't know why. Other people have said the same thing. Maybe it's something for you to take note of if you're hoping to have an experience like this someday. I do think that there is some statistical increase if you do it at one o'clock in the afternoon, given you're kind of tired if you're like me working a job in the early morning and then coming back in the afternoon and kind of passing out, I think that there's a higher chance maybe. Maybe that's the reason I began having OBEs because I just had to connect the dots and figure out like how my body was able to leave its body in the, in the, in the most convenient way. Regardless, I was, in a, I was, I was, in, I was wearing this, this nice red shirt it's my favorite, one of my favorite shirts, but it disappeared. I think I gave it to Goodwill or something. I don't know. I, I just remember I had this red shirt and shorts on and socks. I was in Los Angeles in my rental home and I'm in a little bedroom that was way too small. And on, on my little single bed and I lay down and something started happening. I felt a weird physical sensation come over me, like an energetic feeling, like a, almost like a spinning and like this, um, you know, just, just this energy that, that quickly went over my body. And then I saw myself in my bedroom mirror and wearing my same red shirt, but there was a second me on the bed wearing the same red shirt, just lying there and that was my sleeping body. And now I was floating above my body and I looked awkward. It looked, it looked like, um, you know, it looked like I was trying to keep balance because I had my arms out. It's like, woo, where am I? I can't believe it. Why am I, why am I floating around? What's happening? Like, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was feeling. And then something was pushing me up and I went above the mirror where I was floating in the room. And then suddenly I was in the attic of the house. And so it's a house I was renting. The landlady lived upstairs. So I think I must have gone through her, through her bedroom. And then I was in the attic which I'd never really been in the attic in that house. I have no reason to, but I um, later went into the attic. I was like, okay, this is the attic I was in. I didn't. I, I never even went up here before. I don't even think I knew there was an attic. You have to one of those old-fashioned ones. You have to pull the you know pull like the trap door down from the ceiling, and then you guys there was a ladder. Anyway, so I'm in the attic and it's pitch black. I'm like, okay, where am I? I'm still in the house. Ah, and then I float up higher. I see the house. And something is, let me tell you, something is doing this. I, I, it wasn't me controlling this. Like something, someone was pulling me along. And then I went up again, but now suddenly I was not floating anymore. I was now solid as a rock. And I was in a big, like, I don't, not grassy field, but like a, like a thicket. 
So there was there was just these thick bushes everywhere. I was just in the middle of somewhere in nature. And I realized I just went out of my body and I am now in the astral plane. And then the astral plane is also what we call the afterlife dimension, the place I've been studying for freaking, you know, last 15 years. And now I'm really there and this is this is great. And so I turn around and then there's a big temple that this is where I this is where I was dropped off. So this so there it was like this big white and marble temple in this kind of thicket area. It kind of looked Greek, I suppose. And I did see people walking around in white robes and that kind of cliche stuff. And I'm like, well, there, well, there's your cliche afterlife with the temples and people in robes. And I'm like. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how long this is going to last. I'm just going to start walking. And so I just started walking. And I was I was going through the thicket and I thought to myself, I can't this is this is what was on my mind because it's, it's funny because I don't think I've actually I I've shared this experience in my book and on the YouTube channel, but I don't think I've ever mentioned this part. I remember um going through the thicket and like um crunching through the branches and thinking I can't believe I'm getting poked by wooden branches like that are like affecting my skin, poking into me, and I'm in some other dimension. Like the afterlife is not supposed to be uh, this physical. Uh, the afterlife is supposed to be like we're floating around in energy bodies and it's all love and light and non-physical because this is something all these new age authors kept pushing all the time that the afterlife is a non-physical place or it's a mental place or it's a construction of your mind how can i be getting poked you know poked in the abdomen by all these plants because i went off path and then here i am having the experience i'm thinking to myself well like i'm having this whole like intellectual debate with myself while i'm out of body and i'm in this astral state i'm thinking well but I remember reading Leslie Flint communicators saying that their world is just as real and just as physical as this one. And it's one of the biggest shocks to the system when people get to that side because they pass away here and then they wake up there and they don't think that they've died because they had an idea in their mind that, oh, well, I'm in heaven now. So, I, you know, it needs to be like I'm floating around and then there's Jesus and the saints and you know all this kind of thing they don't think about it as like mountains and plants and nature and dirt and grass and houses but that's what the fourth dimensional astral world is like according to the flint communicators and then when you go into like old channeled information like the anthony borgia books of de Monsieur Hugh Benson, the Catholic uh, priest, I guess, or parishioner. I don't remember his title exactly. Maybe he was a cardinal. But regardless, he was, a, he was a very high on the hog member of the Catholic Church. Wrote a lot of books about the afterlife in this world uh, you know, in a very super religious -y context. Passes away, allegedly is channeled by the medium Borgia, begins writing books about the afterlife and again the same description real solid physical place not imagined not this non-physical creation where you're just floating around as this orb of light or whatever so a, you know a legit place and so i'm actually debating all this while i'm getting poked in the rib cage by these plants and i think also man do i have freaking organs in this body could someone come and cut me open and then take out, you know, you know, uh, um, you know, find find my kidneys or something like? And well, what what effect would that have? Like I'm having these I'm having these philosophical questions while I'm going through this um, thicket, and also wondering how long is this going to last? Because part of me can actually still feel my body laying on the bed. And there goes another 747 airplane. If you can hear that in the background, but anyway. Part of me can still uh, feel myself laying on my bed in LA, like the little piece of me. I almost felt like I could like reactivate myself and shoot back into my body. Like I, I kind of felt like I was in control. 
but it was still just as real and lucid as being awake in this world. So it's like the, almost like being in two places at once. Later on, I would find this to be a fairly common phenomenon and not at all unusual because you're not dead. You still have a body that's just sleeping and you can be conscious of both things at the same time. That's normal. So anyway, but, but nonetheless, I'm still going through the thicket and then I get out from the thicket, I find a road. And I think, well, I'm on a road, I'm gonna go this direction. Now, something happens around this point. And I think it has to do with the nature of the brain or psychology, but it's like the amygdala takes over because I go through this excitement phase and I'm thinking about where I am and I'm thinking about, you know, this is just like all the stuff I've researched, I'm really here. And then I like, ha I start tripping out. I start having like this panic attack because I'm like, I think in retrospect, it's because the really the, the part of me that was still very skeptical about it all was having a wake up call. Like I was having an existential anxiety attack because I realized, you know, I'm not a true believer in an afterlife, at least I wasn't at that point. And so I think this really does mean that everything is wrong about reality and this is all real and I could really be here, but and then I start doubting. I'm like, it's like get that skeptical side that, that's coming back. It's like, no, it's impossible. I couldn't really be in a place like this. This can't be really happening. This is nonsense. But why am I actually physically here? So I began going through this panic attack just as a couple of people find me on the road. And it was a East Indian man and woman, I think husband and wife, but they could have been brother and sister. And I still know these guys because this, this, this guy was like unusually like Bollywood style handsome, like this really handsome looking guy. His wife was pretty also, but I think, that, I think, this, was, I think this guy, um, he just knew how to be like a good looking guy. And he wore this, well, the wife had like a sh one of those like shari dresses on and the man had, well, in, in, in India, there is like a traditional male dress. And I, I'm forgetting the name of what it's called off the top of my head, but very fancy looking. And his was like cream colored or burgundy colored kind of, and had a lot of like fancy designs on it. Anyway, the point is, he found me now walking toward him and having this, being in this, you know, falling into this anxiety attack. And he says, hey, and he reach, puts his arm aside. It's like, welcome to the afterlife. You're here. <laughs> and I'm just like, shit. And then I just, <laughs> I go down on my knees. I'm like, oh my God, I, is this really happening to me? I really, this really is happening to me. And um, then he sees that I, I'm not doing well because now I'm on, on my knees, I'm freaking out. And then he identifies me as having an out of body experience. And he says, um, well, I'm trying to remember what he, what he said exactly, but uh, um, no, actually, no, he didn't say anything to me. I ask him at this point, I say, how can I be sure that any of this is real? What's happening? How could this be a real solid place? It's not supposed to be like this. So this guy, you know, and his wife, um, well, he, he kneels down next to me and he has a chat with me and he says, look, you're having an out of body experience. And I, I nod and I'm like, yeah, I am. And he said, as these experiences begin happening to you, uh, there's some things you have to keep in mind. And I'm, I'm really paraphrasing here. I have the exact dialogue written down someplace. It's, it's not next to me at the moment. But to paraphrase what I remember him telling me was that you may start having a lot of these experiences. You may you may find yourself able to you know be in two places at once, to be in your, in the earth plane and to be here you know in this world. And he said that as you explore this world, you will find that it may not always seem like it's complete reality. It may not always seem like you're completely here. And you may even question if it's really happening. And he said the reason for that is because you're not dead yet. You're connected still to your physical brain on that side, on the, on the earth plane. 
and uh, you're not a hundred percent here you're literally this is when they say astral projecting you're just projecting a piece of yourself to us I would later learn that when you project sometimes you're the one who's a ghost sometimes you're the one who's like semi translucent or not completely in their world and he said because of this you know you're gonna have experiences where you might not know that you're completely on our side but he said something to me that I'll never forget and this has painted my interpretation of that side he said that look he reached down, he picked up the earth with his hands. He said, this is real physical soil. I'm holding it with my fist. And he said, when the day comes that you are really here, you're 100% here in what your people call an afterlife or the astral plane. When you're really, really here, there is no better feeling in existence to find that you're still alive in a completely real, realer than real, solid, natural environment, a continuation of the life that you were living on Earth, continued in this wonderful environment. And um, until that day comes, you, as an astral projector, you'll only be able to come close to experiencing it, but you may not ever be completely here so you must keep this in mind because and, and instead of doubting or having anxiety and wondering is this a real experience or you know a fake experience or in my brain just understand it may not always seem completely real to you because um when you're the nature of astral projection is that you're not fully in our world when you do it but you're in our world enough to be able to experience it and learn about it and if I could find the full transcript again, I, I talked to his wife a little bit or made a couple of jokes about something which I thought were pretty interesting when I came back, but um, it obviously wasn't as important as this main message, which was the main point I got back from this experience. And I'm just like, okay, bro, you know, you got me. And then I, then I felt my body was about to wake up again. I said, well, I guess I'm out of here. And he's like, you know, take care. And then, and then, boom, my eyes open and the experience is done. But at this point, I have no doubt that the reason he knew so much and he could share so much is that this was like a school of, um, of dimensional understandings, I, you know, as a school of learning about the differences between, you know, different realms of existence and you know, a place of like spiritual practice. I don't know if it was like a Hindu type place or it was just coincidental that they were Indian. But that was the nature of this environment or this temple. And I never came back to that temple since then. But I did begin having many more experiences now from that point no longer in that temple, but in a piece of astral real estate, which is the same house I grew up in back in Arizona, long ago bulldozed, long gone, but a place where I think my I have been go, had been going to probably since I was a kid at some point, and this is something you learn later on doing this, and also you can go into spiritist literature talks about this that basically our houses the things we care about kind of replicate themselves onto the astral plane in a real like patch of I called astral real estate so I don't know who facilitates it or how it happens maybe we do on the other side maybe our guides help us I don't know how but like they will help take like a house we have here something we like like or enjoy here to the corresponding physicality location on the astral earth and then kind of copy and paste it all over and that becomes a place that you just end up going to as like a default location now you know years since that time it's still the default location i end up if i have a proper astral projection experience and it's also the default location that members of my family go to, whether it's my living brother, who I sometimes see when he's sleeping here, he projects into this place, but also all the members of my family who suddenly passed away not long after I had this experience. First, my mom passed away, then one of my brothers, and then my father passed away. And 
by the time my mother passed away first, I'd already had countless out-of-body experiences and a lot of crazy things happening, which I would have to get into a different time. But uh, I was already well-versed enough that I'm, I almost immediately began communications and meetings with my mom. Not only where she went to, which was like a hospital or a psychological healing facility on the astral plane, but when she got out of that place, I was able to meet up with her in the um, astral replica home and talk about important issues with her. I mean, she could talk to me about what she went through in the hospital, how she felt, things she wanted to get off her chest and communicate with me about, and then eventually start to have kind of this normal relationship where I would astral project into the same family home and be like, hi, mom, and then she would like make me food, ice cream, or she'd cook something, or minestrone, I, you know, come and then, you know, we'd eat and sit and talk and maybe it only lasts like 15 minutes. But, you know, I, I always, I'd always be very pressed for time. Like, look, I'm, I'm going to snap out of this any minute. So let's just do the most we can as quickly as we can. I think sometimes it's led to a little bit, of, you know, some small arguments because I'm like, mom, don't go to the garage to get something right now because I'm here and then this is going to, this experience is going to end any minute and it might be a month and a half until I have another proper experience with you again. So just don't, you know, let's just make the most of it and talk and share as much as we can before I snap out of it. And then, yeah, so we could have the experience, talk, hang out. And then usually again, 10, 15, 20 minutes later, I start feeling my physical body on the bed a little too much. And I'm like, crap, it's about to end. Anything else you want to talk about? We talk, we catch up, and then it's done. And then, you know, maybe six, seven weeks later, I might have a similar thing with her again. For a while, she was visiting me. And so she would come to my bedside with while I was not completely out of my body, just like maybe partially, just enough to see, hear, and talk to her, typically telepathically. And, you know, she would very physically be on my bed next to me. We'd talk. But I came to find that with spirit people, they are not big fans of coming down to see us. They really prefer it if we go to see them because to see us, they have to go to this place we call the ethereal zone. It's a place in between the astral dimension and this dimension. And it's basically like in the film Ghost with Patrick Swayze, when you are a ghost and you, you're, you're on this vibration, but you can't connect with things, you can't feel things, you can't touch things, unless it happens to be like astral matter, then you can. But you'll see all these weird manifestations of your subconscious floating around. There'll be weird entities. People have all these negative experiences on that side with shadow people and things like that. It's just, it's an infamous state of existence that's in between these worlds. The Greeks would call it Hades, or we would also call it the nether world. And the nether world is not a place that they want to go to, but they will if that's the only way to make contact with us. So once my mom didn't have to go to the nether world anymore to make contact, and I was consistently going there, then it was great. Yeah, now years later, I some people say that our loved ones become unreachable because they merge with source consciousness or, you know, they get d devoured by the light or they disappear or they whatever, you know, that, that there's only a small period of time when we can meet with our deceased loved ones. And to that, I say it's a bunch of hogwash. I do think that sometimes our deceased loved ones will, um, shall we say, uh, go to a different realm that we may not have access to. I think this can happen, but the party is at the astral earth plane. Now, upon retrospect and some interesting revelations as of late, I do believe that the typical type of environment I go to is what the Monroe Institute would call Focus 27, which is a kind of have, quote, heavenly environment because it's much nicer than this world. But it will come as a shock to people because even if it's much nicer and everyone communicates telepathically and people can fly and teleport themselves, um, there's still so much about it which is just shockingly similar to this world. 
people work in jobs and you're like, why are you working a job where you're flipping Astral hamburgers at an Astral McDonald's? Because sometimes people just continue doing what they're the most comfortable with. And so people may, may just continue their lives on that um, earthly plane of existence, the one that looks and looks like our world, um, for I'd say indefinitely, unless somebody has a real calling elsewhere. And I think you especially see this with uh, so-called star seeds, people who's people who are incarnations of say extraterrestrial races. Like they may go to some different planet, some different plane of existence, and yeah, they may disappear, or at least not be immediately reachable. But I think most of the time. Your deceased loved ones are in this astral state that I first experienced at that temple with the Indian couple, later experienced many times at the astral replica home and many other places and environments and realms over the years as I've documented um, elsewhere. And that is the fundamentals because that same astral condition is the same one described by spirits, the same one described by mediums, same one described by you know, spirit people all over the place, dating back through spiritualist literature. Same place, when you're there, it's pretty darn normal. You know, you have technology, TVs and internet and food in the fridge, and you ha yes, you get all these special perks that come with like this fourth, possibly fifth dimensional existence, being able to teleport around and communicate telepathically. And my mom says she can even be in like four or five places at once, like she can replicate her consciousness, all this crazy stuff that we cannot do. But if you put all that stuff aside, it's still a normal freaking planet with, frankly, and this is be a big shocker. There's a lot of weird stuff I've discovered having these experiences, but some of the weirder ones have been from turning on the television, seeing nightly nightly news programs, a TV host talking about something happening in China, but not our China, astral China, finding out that figures from history from you know a thousand years ago are like living and active on that side. Uh, imagine going to Italy and uh, seeing a presentation by Julius Caesar. That's what it's like on the astral Earth. So it, you better believe it's, you know, by comparison, it's unbelievably exciting with so much stuff going on, especially considering the context of everyone who passes away here, <clears throat> at the very least, has access to that level of existence. Even I think people who are like, you know, super advanced, holy, mighty souls who advance to, you know, level level 17 of the spiritual planes of existence and they are now omniscient, omnipotent. Even that person who advances so far, I mean, I still think they can project themselves down to the astral plane. So it is like this huge, just like smorgasbord of different souls and civilization and things happening and all of this and there's so much of it and um, cities and towns on that side like often in my experience they're bigger than the ones here astral Tucson Arizona forget about it it's like there's like these huge silver skyscrapers everywhere and you have cars on the ground sometimes cars flying in the air all kind of, I mean it's like a combination it's like futuristic but also anachronistic sometimes you'll have things like out of the 1900s or communities from even further back mixed with like very futuristic advanced things so I'm telling you it's just there's so much depth to it it really blows your mind when you get to see some of it even if it's like on your astral couch looking at the astral television or browsing the astral internet which all the things that I've done and you and then you, you you get a you get a glimpse that way so that's my perspective about what the afterlife is like so right away I think it contradicts a lot of existing taboos and existing information which may claim that all those things are impossible because you know, somebody is writing up about what the afterlife is like based upon a lifetime of, I don't know, Buddhist fundamentalism or Hindu fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism. 
and then they end up with something very different Ex expectations massively change and what I just described would seem impossible but again if you go back through spiritualist lore and what spirits have said through powerful mediums over the centuries on back to Swedenborg the original out-of-body explorer from the 1700s most of them say variations of the fact that people pass away here and they're surprised or shocked by the solid by the solidarity or solidity I should say of the other side how it's a real living like parallel planet and it's not all these other conceptions that they used to have in their minds so to summarize now at the one hour mark for this podcast to summarize my experiences matched up with what the spiritualists said and matched up with what the medium said dating back quite a ways did not match up with some of the very new agey type philosophies out there that kind of pigeonhole what an afterlife is like or say that oh, there's no such thing as negative emotions or um, there's no such thing as physical substance or that the afterlife is a dream world that you just temporarily create to you know serve a purpose and then you go back to being one with the universe and they'll have these like very like sometimes it seems like it's the projections of just what people want to happen maybe as a way to escape from their lives and I do think that there's many levels and there's upper astral conditions as well and there's very beautiful like um, like transcendent realms as your consciousness expands as you expand the ability to travel into other worlds all of it becomes more real more like solid you, you lucid awareness only increases as you move up that chain and even as your consciousness expands, you become more aware of your greater self or your, quote, higher self. And as you become more in union with these things, you only become more you. You become more of an individual. You become a greater embodiment of the divine than you were before, as opposed to what you hear about in religious areas and religious interpretations. Let's say it's the opposite. You become less of what you were. You become less physical. You become less substantial less individual you quote ego dies which is one of the most misinterpreted words in the english language i think people thinking that this means that you become less of who you were your identity goes away and on and on and on and it's the opposite it's like you become a greater representation a more powerful entity a more powerful you your personality becomes more uninhibited more pure as you advance on a spiritual level as you come into a concordance with the divine creation that you are again same stuff i read about in spiritualist literature and you know resources like silver birch for example and some of these great um spiritual teachers like it all just like my experience is it all just lines up with all this stuff and so at the end of it all i'm like okay well i guess that was all true then because I've gotten to see it for myself, and that's it. That's the end of this podcast. I hope this was useful to you. I encourage you, if you like the work I'm doing, to become a patron at patreon.com forward slash afterlife topics. Without the help of patrons, then I won't be able to keep doing this kind of work, podcasts, videos, and books, because it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and so I typically don't work a full-time job if I'm committed to my online stuff and my finances take a huge hit. I live out of a backpack, travel Asia, travel the world, but um, I, you know, I still need that assistance to be able to keep going with these projects or else that the, 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 show, is, the show will have to come to a, an early end as I focus on terrestrial means of supporting myself again. But you know, even if I want to live like a uh, happy little impoverished nomad for the time being and focus on this stuff, it's one of the reasons I left USA about a year ago now, because I wanted to try my best to support myself with this kind of work in my books and just focus on this and live a very humble life and see if it adds contentment to happiness, which it has. So special thank you for some of you guys out there who have made that possible couple of the super patrons out there you know you guys know who you are well i'll just 
I'll just do a quick shout out, Bentley and Molly, thank you guys, and others who have contributed a lot in this area to allow me to keep producing content, working on new books, new projects, new videos, and managing the community. So thank you guys for making all that possible. And thank you, listeners, for hearing this podcast tonight. And we will have a third episode coming out in the near future. So if you happen to be listening to this on iTunes or any other podcast avenue, please be sure to uh, subscribe or like it or share it or any of those things to uh, stay in touch and to get the word out and to be on top of new updates as they come along if you find this topic.